Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm uh, Josh. Yep, I'm from the uh, Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. I'm currently running um, a project called Team Wilder for the Wildlife Trust. So I've, we're working on a community engagement project, which is kind of looking at the is looking at new ways of engaging with people around nature. Um, I'm actually doing this is sort of my final piece of work on my last the, the previous project I was working on, which was Wild Landscapes. Um, that's how I know Rob from Friends of the Modern Valley. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, thank you for Avon These Trees and Friends of the Martin Valley for inviting me. Um, today, I hope that we can open the door and take a glimpse into the world of fungi. It's a very big world and a, a bit of a, a mysterious, um, slightly confusing one for those that um, yeah, have kind of no insight already. Um, I'm gonna hopefully explain everything in the simplest way possible. Um, the idea from today is that everyone can go away feeling like they have grasped the basics and that we have had a nice steady intro into the sub subject. Um, a disclaimer, this is, a, I, have to, I have to say this, I am not the Wildlife Trust, I'm representing the Wildlife Trust. So any kind of, um, yeah, anything that I say, the science is the science, but any of my views and my personal views and do not represent the Wildlife Trust. Right. So we should, what would a presentation be without a, a, a good quote to start off? Normally from someone that uh, people don't know um, or the presenter doesn't know, but this is um, from Capra, who is an American physicist. The more complex the network is, the more complex its pattern of interconnections, the more resilient it will be. I think that the ecosystem in which we are all a part of, to even pretend that we can fully understand or grasp the sort of vastness and the complexity of it. Um, you know, we, we, we're so far away from that. I think that what ecology and what conservation and what the whole world of science is trying to do is, is take a step closer. And hopefully from us kind of delving into the world of fungi, we will be taking a step closer too. Um, However, things change, science changes, and the system needs to be as complex as it is. So who knows, in 10, 15 years time, this talk may be completely redundant. We never know what we're going to learn. So to start off, the kingdom of fungi. Um, within this complex system, um, there are kind of, they've been categorized into the kingdoms of biological life. Now, for a long time, fung fungi were stuck with plants. And for a long time, there are only, only two, two kingdoms, um, which was the animal and the plant kingdom. In 1967, um, fungi got separated into its own, its own kingdom. That's because people started to realize that fungi, although, the fungi didn't move as such like plants. Um, they had to source food outwork, elsewhere. So they are not producing any chlorophyll. They are not using photosynthesis to produce their own food. They are something that we call um, heterotrophic, which means they rely on other organisms to give them food. Um, we're going to be focusing on the kingdom of fungi. There are some exceptions. Um, slime mold, which often is thought of as a uh, fungi, a lot of molds are fungi, actually doesn't sit in the fungi world. Um, I haven't mentioned much about slime mold. Um, however, I, I will kind of point people in the direction of finding out some very interesting things about it. Um, we will touch on some of the other kingdoms because it's all connected. So, Fungi or mushroom? Um, just a bit of kind of clarification on terminology. Um, the mushroom is a part of a fungus. So the fungus is the being, the fungi, the fungi are the beings, and the mushroom is a fruiting body. It is a reproductive organ of that. Um, fungi can be yeasts, they can be rust, 
smuts, mildews, molds, and they are mushrooms. Fungi can be made up of a, a single cell, they can be multicellular. Um, they range from being tiny microscopic yeasts to being humongous organisms. Now, you can see on the left here, we've got a, a artist's interpretation of prototaxis. So prototaxis was found as a fossil in 1849. Um, it took quite a few years for people to really work out what that was um, but this is a 360 million year old fungus so imagine yourself back in that time where the plants that you see surrounding it uh, were no no taller than one and a half meters so we've got a we've got a fungus there that could have been eight meters or higher towering over these plants and these were the dominant life forms of the planet we don't know exactly how they look. That is a uh, interpretation. There's some beautiful kind of um, different sketches of them if you ever decide you wanna look it up with beautiful kind of almost floral like patterns coming out of them. So 120,000 species have been named or described in the world of fungi. And it's estimated that there's about 6 million species that are currently existing on the planet. So that kind of gives you an idea of the rapidly evolving world of, of mycology and the fact that it really is quite recently that we've we've jumped on this mushroom fungi bandwagon and started learning about them. So like I said before, the, the mushroom is the fruit body and actually it's quite a small percentage of that fungi's life that it spends as a mushroom. So 95% of that lifespan, it is mycelium. Now, I'm going to dive into these, uh, all of these terms and we're going to go a bit more in depth, but that's just a nice kind of um, image to, to show you that, that time scale. So we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to start with the spores. So I just want to check, are you seeing the highlighted screen sharing bar? Is it covering text or is that just on my screen? I think by the look, that's a no. Right, I'm going to carry on. Sorry, everyone. Um, See the blue so, dot. Oh no, that's okay. No, absolutely fine. I just wanted to check. I've got a thing saying about screen sharing. Right, back to it. Spores. So, spores are the reproductive yes. cell. Yes, of I the can mushroom. see it. You can see it. Can I move that? There we go. Is that better? We hope so. Right. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so the spores. The spores are the reproductive cells. These are essentially the seed of the fungus. The size varies, but a typical spore is about 10 microns or about one 2,500 2, of an inch wide. So these are tiny, tiny microscopic seeds. Seeds. Um, they are created in, in a, a part of the fungi, the, the basidium, um, attached to a stalk, and they sort of hang under the fungus. Now there's various different ways that these can be dispersed, and they are also created in different ways. They're not always created via a fruiting body or a mushroom. Um, a lot of mushrooms do not have a fruiting, a lot of fungi do not have a mushroom. They stay just underground and create their spores internally and push through the soil or whatever substrate they are colonizing. Now, these spores, if they land in the right environment, um, they then are able to grow, hyphae grows. If there is the right water conditions, if there's the right humidity, if there's the right um, heat, all of these are, you know, generic environmental factors that are going to, the same as a seed hitting the ground, um, going to stop or start germination. For this reason, mushrooms or the fungi produce billions of spores. So on the top right here, you'll see this is an artist conch. You can actually see the spores. Sometimes when there, there are so many spores in one confined place, they kind of, um, 
appear as dust. So what you can see, this brown dust that's hanging over, these are billions of spores, and these have been produced by the artist conch, called an artist conch, because the white base of this mushroom and the spores that stick mean that if you were to remove it, you can draw a picture in the base. Now, these billions of spores, they can travel at extreme speeds. Now, they come out of the basidium and detach from their stalk at speeds up to 25,000 times the force of gravity. So that's pretty extreme. And now we sort of imagine spores flying at high velocity everywhere. Actually, that's not what's happening because the size of the spore and then hitting the air once it's released slows it down. And what actually happens is it comes out, this force gets away from the mushroom, hits the rest of the air surrounding it and drifts off in air currents. So here we have some spores being produced on a basidium. Um, the stems are called the sterigma and they are holding those little egg-like egg spores. Now, that speed, the way that these spores are re released, um, is through surface tension propulsion. Um, that can be air, that can be water. And essentially, the process begins with condensation um, or a water droplet at the base of the spore. The fusion of the droplet onto the spore creates a momentum that propels the spore forward. So you can sort of imagine these little guys getting flung off everywhere. This is, um, this is a close-up image, close image of a, a grey shag mushroom. Um, for reference, there you go, there is a grey shag mushroom. Um, when we see these things, it's sort of incredible to think that they could be propelling things at such speed. Um, some of you may know this mushroom as a ink cap. They are actually edible. Um, most of the ink caps are edible. There are complications with storage. They tend to, to mush pretty much instantly and also they shouldn't be mixed with alcohol. But um, they were historically used for ink um, that couldn't be uh, forged. It was a, a, an anti-forgery um, tactic using this ink. So, like I said, spores can get dispersed in lots of different ways. Um, that is the, the artist conch that, that I just showed you, and that's the full, the full image. Um, you can see them get quite, quite large. Um, so polypores, they have small, tiny pores hanging under them, and that's what we're looking at here. And what we've got here, we've got a belete mushroom, which is almost like a sponge. So inside of these holes down the tube, they have similar structures that are holding the spores to release them. We've then got gilled mushrooms. This is a, a mycena rotting away a piece of wood. And um, that would be very similar to the image that we previously saw. Now we've got these wonderful shapes up here. We've, we've got an earth star and we've got a puffball, common puffball here. Now, they rely on a little bit of a different tactic. So hopefully you can see that video. There we have a puffball puffing. Now, puffballs have evolved to sporulate on reaction with an external stimuli. So they rely on an animal passing by, knocking them, me tapping them, or raindrops would ordinarily be falling and puffing out the spores of the puffball. There's some other pretty wacky ways of getting spores around. We've got here, this is, a, these are both stink horns actually. This is the traditional stink horn with a rather appropriate name in Latin, which is Phallus impudicus. Well, I don't know why. But um, what these mushrooms do is they excrete, excrete a um, stinky black liquid that mimics rotting flesh and they attract flies or rodents to come eat that and then go and put that out elsewhere and spread those spores around so just like plants have evolved and have crazy ways of getting seeds around fungi have uh, yeah definitely definitely done the same um, this on the right hand side is one of my favorite finds. Um, this is a, a Clallus rubber, which is a caged stink horn. It's actually opened up. They can be found like a basket fully formed. 
it's um most stink horns essentially hatch out of an egg they they form a an egg this is what you can see here um it's sort of about a golf ball size what you can see inside it's got this beautiful um gelatinous uh honeycomb structure um they are just fascinating and fun fact is that these eggs are actually calcium rich so you can eat that egg I'm not sure that I want to eat the egg knowing what's going to come out of it um all the liquid that it is producing inside but they are it is calcium rich so from the spores the spores land and they start producing hyphae now I will make a quick note genders or sex within these organisms uh it's not black and white there are not male there are not female most of the mushrooms produce um can produce asexually um they look for compatible um colonies of hyphae so some fungi are able to produce and carry on just on their own whereas some need to rely on two compatible hyphae pairs or colonies coming together so side note, there will be an image and this will come a little bit clearer in a little while. So the hyphae, these are the filaments. These are the strands. This is what's going to build up. And we're going to start seeing the picture soon. But this is these are the tiny, tiny filaments that make up the mycelium and then later form together and create what we see as a fruiting body, a mushroom. These are individual connected cells here. And they can they can go from being microscopic again and growing tiny, tiny, you know, millimeter, micron, you know, micrometer sized cells. And then they can pair up and they can grow to be a few centimeters. They can grow to be hundreds of meters in length. Um, the average diameter is two to ten micrometers. Now let's put that into perspective there. It's got the, a human hair is 100 micrometers. So we, we really are looking at a very, very small filament. The hyphae branch out and they grow in all directions from the spore. They form a circle often, which is called a colony. So this is what I was saying. So the colony then is able to be found by another if needed to by that particular species of fungi. Some fungal colonies can grow very, very long. And in a couple of slides, you're going to see quite how long. But um, it's these hyphae that make up everything that we see from this point onwards. The mycelium. So this is what we refer to as the organism. So you could argue uh, the hyphae is the organism, it is a cell, it's doing all of the work, but the mycelium is when these hyphae have come together and they've started to create. So once it's become a colony, the hyphae, this is a mycelial mass. So this is, I suppose, what you could call the actual living organism or the equivalent of a perennial crown um, if you were going out in your garden. This is the highway for transportation and uptake of nutrients. This is the, the brain would be the wrong word, but this, this is the action station of the organism. It's the mycelium that takes it forward that would allow it to connect with other organisms, like mycorrhizal, which again, we will be coming to. This is, this is the part of the, the, the fungi that is taking food. This is the part that is, is now active. So from the mycelium, the fungi is absorbing nutrition from surrounding organic matter. Um, like I said, they, they go out elsewhere to source their food. So, so fungi actually externally digest. So the hyphae explores the soil, the mycelium explores the soil, looks through the substrate, is what we would call it, and they secrete digestive enzymes. So these enzymes break down the matter into smaller parts that feed not just the fungi, but also plant partners and other organisms, protozoa, amoeba, the different bacteria living in the soil. They can ferment, they can ferment food externally to make it more digestible for them. So, you know, they're out there kind of in their, in their microscopic kitchens making some kombucha. Um, 
it's it's a it's it's a fascinating world down there um it's this that provides the network of communication between between the, the fruiting body and the primordia so allowing them to know the environmental conditions and it is this that is going to produce that that, that mushroom um, for every one meter of tree root there is one kilometer of mycelium so there, there's a bunch of statistics that kind of get you know thrown around and I'm, I'm never sure quite on the accuracy of them um, one that I really like is that in every square meter of soil in a forest the hyphae if put tip to tip would stretch around the world 32 times so that's sort of you know that gives you the sort of scale of what we're looking at underground now I mentioned these get really really big they can grow to humongous size the largest living organism on earth is a honey fungus armillaria um, covering 2384 acres of soil in the oregon's blue mountains 1665 football fields so yeah I, ca I can't quite imagine that but that that is one mushroom one fungus that is producing mushrooms and infecting and you know actually it's a parasite so it's it's eating away at a huge huge stretch of land and all of those mushrooms are connected by the mycelium that's running through various debris running through the soil running through other trees so and it's still growing so unless it dies or something serious happens it's only going to get bigger and i'm pretty sure it will not be contested for being the largest living organism I suppose, who knows, we may find another fungus somewhere else that's doing the same thing. So the fruiting body. Like I said, this is the reproductive stage. Um, the main purpose of the fruiting body is to produce spores. It wants the fungus to spread. Um, it, it's a seasonal reaction to the environmental stimuli. Um, they can come in all different shapes and sizes and colours. Um, it's still unknown why some fungi make themselves so colourful. Um, there's a Amanita muscaria, muscaria there, which is the fly agaric mushroom, um, which everyone kind of knows as that fairy tale mushroom. Now, it's very, you know, able to fling its spores left, right, and centre, and doesn't need to be, you know, so bright and colourful. People have theorised that it's that it's due to things that contain toxins, but then there's plenty of mushrooms that are colourful that don't contain any toxins. So just a quick note, before the mushroom turns into a fully fledged mushroom, it forms primordia, which you can see here. Um, this is actually on a, a, a oyster grow bag that's growing. I've got it sat next to me right now. Um, but these tiny pinheads um, are what come out, and, and this comes from a hyphal knot. So the, hy the hyphae all bond together in that mycelium it starts knocking itself up and it pokes itself up and it's it's said the time is right let's go have a look if if the time isn't right and it was wrong they're not normally wrong it will kind of shrivel up they'll shrivel up and you can see lots of thin heads that look very weak and, and fallen but that will then evolve into being a full fruiting body now they really do range in size and shape and color they can go from being the tiniest mushrooms and you see that and that's that's my thumbnail there to give you scale this is a, a dryad saddle mushroom um which nearly i was very excited when i found it nearly beat the record for the largest dryad saddle found um it's this was this was 50 centimeters in diameter now the record is something like 52 and I remember looking it up and being very excited but I wasn't quite uh, yeah I wasn't quite there we've got the cauliflower fungus here which is just an, an an odd kind of freak of nature we've got coral funguses here ex exquisite coral and delicate beautiful colors here multicolored this is a this is a a, a deceiver mushroom the tr the the um the jewel color colored deceiver which combines the amethyst dece deceiver and the salmon deceiver and 
almost twist this purple and salmon into each other is yeah beautiful what we've got here is um an anemone stink horn so this would fruit this is almost like a brain this is this came out of an egg sac and this would have expanded and gone into something that looks like a, a it should belong in a coral reef um again it's fruiting black liquid now that is the mushroom life cycle we have just kind of crash through that um, and I hope that everyone's still with me. I'll give a little recap. So we've got the spore release. So we started at the spores, we've got the mushroom. From the spores, the spores are released and they land. And some of these spores need two colonies. Here for the example, it's done a plus and a negative. And I think that it's better to kind of think of that in compatibility rather than male and female this then goes for there's mycelial expan expansion these then grow together until the time is right they're eating all their food maybe if they're in a confined space they've they've ate all of the the substrate they've consumed everything they can and they need to move otherwise they're going to starve so it's time to fruit or they've just decided it's time it's time that we we go onwards they form a hyphal knot they form the primordia and then we're back to the beginning. And that is the mushroom life cycle. So we're now going to move into the roles in which these, these fungi play in the ecosystem. We're going to kind of go through some of the different nutritional modes of the fungus. Um, but I think to focus on really what are they doing here? Um, there are theories around the, the, the ability of spores to survive in outer space, meaning literally, did they come from another planet? And have they come to save us? I mean, maybe, maybe they have. I think I sometimes think they have. But um, they are nutrient recyclers. They're cyclers. They are, they are incredible at shifting chemicals around. They are the decomposers. Without them, we'd be filled up with things everywhere. We'd be having trees stacked up everywhere, the fruit bowl that people aren't eating would sit on the side and never go away. They're creating symbiosis, they're symbionts. They are, they are benefiting other organisms and themselves and creating healthy systems. And they're a food source for us and for lots and lots of animals. Now, it's, there's an interesting theory around the evolution of fungi and fossil fuel uh, creation. Now, for a long time, I was under the uh, impression that it was a, a, a for sure. But actually, while researching this presentation, um, I found that there's research coming out that is on both sides. So I'm going to put this forward as a, um, as, as a, as a theory or a hypothesis that that before we before fungi evolved to be able to break down um, this organic matter, predominantly lignin and cellulose that was coming from hard trees, there would have literally been organic mass just building up everywhere. Now, this means that they would that mass would eventually be kind of sat and left with this stringy lignin, which would have formed peat which eventually was transformed into coal. So the idea is that when the, the, the saprotrophic fungi, and we're gonna to come to that, when the, the fungi that could break down these compounds came into being, that was the end of any fossil fuel production. So that was the time that the, the world could, could give coal. And now, unless we lose those fungi, which we really hope we don't, we will not be, getting that again. So the modes of nutrition. So I'm going to break this down. There's basically three main types of fungi. Um, the first is what I was just talking of. These are the great recyclers, the decomposers. These are the saprotrophic fungi. So these guys, they decompose dead organic matter. They obtain nutrients from non-living normally um organic matter by absorbing soluble organic compounds now 
they can be found on still living things, but it would be on a decaying or dead part of that living thing. Um, we're talking about trees, insects, animal waste, fruit, leaves, everything. As if it's being decomposed and rotted down, there's going to be some bacteria in there, but fungi are in there with the primary decomposers, which we've got to the bacteria and the fungi. So most of the, the fungi that exist, or at least that we know about, are, are saprotrophs. Um, that's including the molds and yeasts. Um, most of most of the things that we we have established, most of the fungi that we have kind of found and noted are breaking down things. They play a major role in the soil food web, which um, is something that we're going to touch on a bit, uh, kind of a bit more in depth later. But these they are essentially constantly changing the state of that organic matter to allow it to cycle through the soil and allow it to feed all of the organisms that rely on the soil to live, which is everything. Everything relies on the soil. And these saprotrophs are producing amazing habitat. So without, without them kind of breaking down pieces of wood, there'd be less habitat for invertebrates. The ecosystem energy flow, if you imagine this is kind of if anyone remembers our kind of biology lessons where we talk about consumers and producers, the, the heterotrophs, which I said that all fungi are, but specifically these saprotrophic fungi, they make sure that all of this can carry on. They decompose all of the waste from all of these, and they are the sort of overlookers of the whole of this system. So we've got some examples of some saprotrophic fungi here. Um, I picked the Chlorociborea, which you can see on the left hand side, which is known as the grief elf curve. And I picked this because actually um, it was featured in the event. Um, there were some images in the event kind of advert. And um, it's a really beautiful one of my favorite fungi. Um, it, its mycelium creates a pigment that dyes wood. And it was known as kind of the, the, the blue oak mushroom and it produces these tiny tiny little fruiting bodies but it just has the most beautiful blue and this was a bit soggy so it kind of looks a bit faded but um if you find a dry piece it's gorgeous and it, it's been used historically in, in kind of furniture making and beautiful kind of marquetry um but yeah it's a fascinating mushroom most of the fungi that we cultivate as food are saprotrophic and that's purely because that's easy, that makes sense, um, and it's predictable. We've got an organism that we know wants to eat and wants to break down things. We can find something that is ready to be broken down and we put them together in the right conditions. It can be very tricky growing fungus, um, but oyster mushrooms and the certain other mushrooms that we commonly cultivate, we know because they're so aggressive and good at their job that they're just going to munch away. So this is a, a, a photo on the left of a workshop that I was running. Um, there's some guys cutting up some straw, ready to go into a mushroom bag. And um, what you've got on the right hand side is some logs that I inoculated with some shiitake. Um, essentially, you've just got that clean substrate, you inoculate it and the fungi do the rest. Um, I think it's an interesting thought to think about this in kind of forest systems, food forest systems, when we kind of look forward with agricultural practices, because we know that rotting wood is good for the woodland. We know that it needs that, and we know that we want food. And I, I, I believe that if we could do more fungus, you know, mushroom production on logs around the place, it would be a win-win. We'd be breaking down things, providing good habitat and good food and resilient food. You can have a log and it can be fruiting for five, six, seven years after you inoculate it every year. So, yeah. Okay, so we come to the, the second type of mode of nutrition, our second kind of band of, of fungus. These are the parasitic fungi. Now, these guys, they feed on living hosts. Um, they feed, they live in or on other organic organisms. Um, they use enzymes to break down living tissue. 
normally. Um, they're usually killing cells in the process. Some, some parasitic fungi will kill their hosts and some of them will damage them or leave them with a part of them that they can then feed on, like I said before, and kind of leave that essentially dead to the organism. There are three types of parasitic fungi. Ectoparasites, which live on the surface. So this is th these are things like leaf mold, rust, athlete's foot. <laughs> um, you've got endoparasites, which live inside the tissue. Um, this is like the artist conch. So this artist conch is living there and maybe 20 years until it hurts, damages or kills the tree, but it is feasting and it is killing cells of that tree. Um, I will speak about a couple of other endoparasites in the next slide. Um, within that bracket also is ash dieback. Um, I'm sure that many of you have heard about ash dieback. It is a fungus disease that is affecting near enough all of our ash tree population in Britain. What I'll do is I'll actually flick over. Um, oh. There we go. So there we have a ash tree in the center there. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. So then we have an ash tree in the center. Um, you can see the effect that it's got an extremely reduced canopy cover and it's looking rather real. Um, the, the ash dieback fungus lives on the, the leaves and the tender stems of the plant. Uh, it infects the, the tree over the summer months and then falls onto the ground um, and overwinters on the ground where it then sporulates back into the atmosphere and then back onto the ash tree population in springtime. It's a pretty scary problem. We've got 95% of all of our trees are infected and 32% of all of our native broadleaf cover is ash. Um, the extra scary thing is that due to the um, similarities and alkalinity of the bark, Ash is very similar to elm. So when we lost elm trees to Dutch elm disease, a lot of the bryophytes, so the mosses, the invertebrates, and the lichens that were living on elm transferred onto ash. So ash is essentially holding two tree, you know, two trees worth of, of species. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of interesting insight, uh, insect parasites. Um, some of you may have heard of the kind of the, the zombie ant um, fungus, or you know they call it. We've got lots of different names. This is what you have on the right hand side. This is probably the coolest thing that I've ever found. That's my hand with a cordyceps. So this is this is cordyceps from the tyrus. Um, They do grow in this country. They are renowned around the world. Actually, the mushroom for its medicinal properties. Um, and it, what it does is the, the fungus infects a living host, marches said host to a suitable place. So it infects the brain and then bursts of fruits through the head of said organism. It's pretty, pretty gruesome, but extremely interesting. Um, a, a less well-known um, is the, uh, I, I, can't, I can never say this properly, I've got this written down, is the, the, the Massospora, um, so Cardiana, <laughs> which is the, the fungus that lives within the brood X cicada. So, so the brood X cicada is a cicada that comes from the eastern um, US. Cicadas are essentially small flying creatures that live all around, um, all around the world, especially in the tropics. Um, and they make a, a wonderful noise of a, a kind of a cracking, like a, a, you know, as the males are searching, they're singing for a female. Now, this particular brood, brood X, they only come out every, well, around every 13, 17 years. Now, an interesting side fact, cicadas have, have a thing about prime numbers. If you, you can kind of look, look up into this, but um, 
Cicadas are known to stay dormant underground for many years, monitoring the electromagnetic pulses made by the trees of the seasons. And for some reason, they only ever come out on a prime numbered year. So 17 years have passed and, and these guys come out. And what we're looking at is we're looking at billions and billions of cicadas that have come out across the Eastern US. Now, if they were left unpredated, um, they would tear through all of the forest. There, there would be no food, they'd rip through, none of the trees would be able to survive. Scary thing is there's no living, uh, well, no kind of insect or animal predator. There is only one predator, which is a fungus. This fungus also stays dormant for the same amount of years. The spores hold in the soil. And as the cicadas come through the soil, they brush up, they collect the spores. And bizarrely, what happens is this fungus infects the rear end below the abdominal on these cicadas and turns them into what has been described in a as a, as a single-minded, essentially sex machine. So it, there is a, a naturally occurring am, amphetamine that is produced by the fungus that causes heightened sex drive within the insects. And then their abdomen, below the abdomen, abdomen it, their genitals fall off, which creates confusion and means that most of the population are trying to reproduce with the same sex and doing very, very kind of, <laughs> they're being very inefficient at trying to reproduce. Um, and what you can see there is the white cluster of spores um, and the growth that has come out of the, the end of the cicada once its um, genitals have fallen off. Um, yeah. So parasitic fungi can get rather weird and wonderful. Quick note, facultative, Fungi. So these are things that can be both um, saprotrophic and parasitic. Um, they're not usually completely killing their host. They have that. They, they, they've got an invested interest. They want to keep that host going. Um, this could be, there's also examples of uh, ergot within corn that can live inside or outside. Um, you see me very happy there with a the chicken of the woods, Latiphorus torfarius. Now, this is another that can live on completely dead wood or it can live on a living host and it would normally infect the living host and create a space where it could then kill that part and live on that dead material as a subtrophe. Okay. And this, what we see here is a beautiful flush of armillaria, the honey fungus, which is the same, it's a different species of armillaria, but it is um, that to the largest organism, but this is one found just by my house, which is probably the biggest flash that I've seen. Also edible, actually. So the final mode of nutrition is symbiotic. So these are mutualistic partnerships. Um, that means that the fungus lives with other organisms. They live harmlessly and they actually live in a beneficial relationship where both individual partners are gaining from that relationship. Lichen is an example of this. Now, lichen is a partnership between usually just, it, it, usually two or more, um, but nearly always including a fungus and an algae. Um, it can also include yeasts and bacteria, and there's a whole mix of micro um, microorganisms that are in that in that partnership. But the main two is the fungi and the, the fungus and the al algae. The fungus is producing a protective home for the algae, and the algae is producing food through photosynthesis and water, and using the air to produce compounds to then feed the fungus. Um, it's nice to note, like in you know, are a, a, a brilliant indicator of healthy ecosystems. And again, if we're referencing the kind of ash dieback um, in relation to kind of ancient or veteran trees, there are a lot of uh, species of lichen that will grow and that are called like the old growth lichens that will only be colonizing and populating tree species that are veteran they are they are very old they are the mature trees 
Now, as we're losing the ash, we're going to lose some really, really important lichen that have, you know, very subtle but very important um, impact on the wider ecosystem. Um, and then the second type of symbiotic is mycorrhiza. Now, mycorrhiza gets its whole new section of this of this presentation. So, on we go, mycorrhiza. So this, this, the Latin, literally, this means myco, fungus, rhizal root. So this is the fungus root. It's theorized that 450 million years ago, when plants were able to evolve out of the water, that, that um, it was mycorrhizal relationships that allowed the plants to survive. So the earliest record of plant fossils that we have, they all seem to have mycorrhizal connections growing on the roots. Um, there are certain seeds that will not germinate without having a mycorrhizal fungus be in contact with it. Um, and to give you a rough idea, it's, it's 80 to 95% of all Earth's plant species form mycorrhizal relationships. So they are reliant on these relationships. That's including mosses, that's ferns, grasses, trees, vegetables in your garden. They're all, nearly all of them are connecting with mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal are interesting because they can act as um, saprotrophic too. So they do break down materials and they take that material to also share with their host um, and themselves. Um, but they're not very good at breaking down the lignin and cellulose, the really hard compounds. Um, they like things that are already kind of on their way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits and why these plants form these structures, and then we're going to go a bit more into the, the types. So mycorrhizal, what they are doing is they are receiving excess carbon which is in the form of sugars from the tree or the plant the plant has produced said sugars and carbon taken that carbon from the atmosphere and produced the sugars through photosynthesis it is then sending them down to the roots the fungi then take this they use some of it to feed themselves and they send some of it onto other plants that they are connected to in exchange, they then supply micronutrients, they, which they have been able to generate through their own enzyme external stomach. Benefits of mycorrhizal is that they are increasing that nutrient supply. So they are able to access a whole heap of, of nutrients that the tree otherwise would not be able to do. It's they're essentially alchemists. They're, they're creating chemical compounds out of other chemical compounds and breaking things down so they're more digestible and then feeding them to the plant. Um, and I've got that decreased runoff, that's the nutrient runoff from the surface. So, and we will come back to this later when we talk about filtration, but essentially that this, this mycelial mat is formed and as the nutrients are spreading down through, it is being caught and then again dealt with. So that could be from rotting leaves on the surface. Having mycorrhizal underground is, is improving drought tolerance. So they, they, they uh, create these sacks underground which contain water. They also transport water around um, and also feed water into the rhizosphere of that tree. Um, it offers protection from pathogens. So we know that, that mushrooms and fungi are incredible at immunity response. Um, they are their own doctors and they're also you know, potentially very, you know, they're doctors for us too. Um, and they are producing a, a, an incredible amount of compounds in their mycelium um, that is also shared. So that might be that there's a pathogen that both the fungi and the plant host are, uh, are in threat by, and that fungus is able to deal with it to save both. Or that could be that the plant is in need of something and the fungus says, hey, mate, I'll, uh, I'll sort you out with that. Um, 
it improves soil structure and carbon storage. So fungi make a compound called glomalin, which is essentially a secure form of carbon. Now they take this carbon, they take this, they've got the sugars, they're making other things, they're taking some things out, and then they also make this compound, glomalin, and they push that out. They push it out of their, their, their body, essentially their hyphae, their structure, and place it into the soil. Now this is a secure carbon storage. This is the drawdown. This is what this is what we talk about with sequestration. This is what we need, and this is what we want to encourage: is the actual drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere back into the soils. Now, if that soil is not disturbed, and the you know various other factors, but it, that will stay even if the fungus dies, essentially. So we've got two main types that we're going to talk around. We've got the ectomycorrhizals and we've got the endomycorrhizals. Now, you're probably getting the hang of this by now. Ecto, ecto, outer, endo, inner. So we've got the outer fungus root here, which is connecting on top of the, the root of the plant. And we've got the endo mycorrhizal which is actually entering in it's growing inside of that plant root tip this is quite a comprehensive um image talk is it, this is a root cro cross section um we're not going to be talking about all of these types of mycorrhizal these are separated here on penetration sites talking about how they actually penetrate into um the root um we're going to be focused on arbuscular mycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal. Okay. So arbuscular mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal. So these are creating arbuscule. So what you see here on the right hand side, this beautiful tree like tree like structure. This is inside the root. This is what we can see over here. This is a root coming here. This is a root. And what we see is a high filament entering the root and creating an arbuscule. Now, what's happening here is the, the fungus is entering and the root, the, the tree is creating a membrane around. And this creates a small cavity in which these two partners, the alchemist and the tree, can exchange. It's a deposit for these molecular payloads. So within the arbuscular mycorrhiza, there's, there's sort of one family, one main family. Within that, there's 230 species. Now that doesn't sound a lot when we talk about 6 million species of fungus, but these 300, 230 species form relationships with over 400,000 plants. Now, arbuscular mycorrhizal aren't so worried about specific hosts. They're gonna connect this plant to this plant to this plant, and they'll live all through the soils and all through. Um, it's the arbus arbuscular mycorrhizal that are normally associated with vegetables, grasses, flowers, shrubs, more tender things, fruit trees, ornamental trees. Um, a lot of the these do not produce a fruit body. So they produce their spores within their high fulfillments and push them out into the soil. We will not know that they are there necessarily by looking for a mushroom. So this is what to give you a, a kind of an example. What we've got here is a basil plant, one grown with arbuscular mycorrhizal and one without. You can see already that on the right, this plant is very, you know, it's a lot healthier. Um, you can also imagine this, this connection essentially elongates the reach of roots. So you can see here that we've now got more roots. We can think of this as an, as an extra connection. They've put an extension lead on the root system and what they're doing is they're, they're resource mining. So this community here is that they're, they're digging out, they're going out into the soil and they're trying to find things to then give their partner. So 
Ammonia gather compounds such as zinc, ammonia, phosphorus. Um, they take water and they they deal with a lot of micronutrients that I can't begin to really explain to you, honestly. Um, lots of hardcore chemistry. Um, but they gather these and they digest them and produce a compound that the tree is receptive to. Um, as they are moving through, when we were speaking about soil, soil kind of improvement and stability, they are essentially taking small particles, they're growing around small particles and they're, they're kind of engulfing them, creating larger aggregates, which is reducing the erosion. It's increased aeration and water infiltration for the soil in general to benefit everything else in the soil food web that's living alongside. These connections are, well, they're magical, <laughs> they're magical, but they are extremely complex. And the way that these fungus can source certain things that the tree needs um, is, very, is very specific. Now, I've mentioned the soil food web a couple of times, and I'm going to try and do an in the nutshell um, overview of this. The soil food web, what you can see here is everything from the kind of the, the top of the top of the ground with the plants and everything beneath. Now I mentioned that saprotrophic fungi and both mycorrhizal fungi are really important for the soil food web. So those saprotrophs, those decomposers, they are taking this organic matter and they're starting breaking it down. They're creating food that's easy, easily palatable by other levels within the soil food web. The reason this is a web and this is not a food chain is because it's the whole. It, it's a very complex system which weaves and winds out, you know, inside and outside of each other. What I really like to get across is that these mycorrhizal fungi not only they don't they not only kind of take one nutrient pass it on and then have an exchange they're calling out and signaling so for example a plant could be in distress for whatever reason that plant needs a certain compound to be able to heal itself that certain compound or that it might be under attack from a certain bacteria, which needs another type of bacteria to come in and, and help. Now they use that mycorrhizal connection to produce or send out other chemicals that will attract other things. So there could be a four step process where the fungus is calling a bacteria that calls something else that then finally extracts the, the product that that root will then absorb that that process can it, it, yeah it and i mean it, it sort of deserves its own webinar um but essentially these connections are the linchpin these are the most important thing um within the within the, the ground within the soil i expect quite a lot of you have moved a plant in the garden or gone to a nursery or pricked out a seedling. Now, when we, when we take one plant and we disturb its system, if we dig a tree up in the garden, we want to move it, it's gonna take some time to, you know, reclimatize, get back to, get back to normal, and, you know, sit itself back up. And when you kind of look at this picture and you kind of take that information around the kind of, that immunity, that, that first aid kit that is built in the soil, if you imagine we're taking that plant and we're putting it somewhere where it's got to rebuild all of those connections, we've got to, it's got to attract the right fungi, it's got to attract the right protozoa, it's got to reconnect with mycorrhizal. It, it's a hard job. And you can imagine for a tree that relies on that and they're a larger organism, that's why they take, they can take a month to bounce back. Um, there are some plants that don't. And in the garden, it's funny, brassicas, Brassicas, uh, a lot of brassicas don't form arbuscular mycorrhizal. So your kale, your broccoli don't actually form that connection. Um, and they tend to be a little bit better at being transplanted. Um, 
Now, we're going to move on to ectomycorrhizae. So, this is what we know as the wood wide web. Now, I do not want to mislead. Within the wood wide web, within a woodland system, there is going to be both arbuscular and ectomycorrhizal fungi. Um, ectomycorrhizal, which sit on the outer of the root, um, nearly always um, partner with woody plants, generally trees. Now, that's 5% five, 5 of plants form relationship with ectomycorrhizal, which makes it sound tiny, right? But then that's including some 25,000 tree species, okay? So when we think of that huge ecosystem that's out there, still 5% of the plants form these relationships. Unlike the arbuscular, where it was going in and digging through and creating, what this does is it, it essentially sits on the top of the root. It connects and the, the, the tree produces a mantle, a layer on top, which then creates that exchange environment on the outer surface. Now, this, these sit about one, one to three millimetre away from the active tip of the roots, the very tiniest in the right rhizosphere that we call, um, very tiniest, tiniest root filaments. Um, as the roots grow, so does the ectomycorrhizal and it moves and it changes position. Um, what you can see on the left here, so we've got a seps, this is a penny bun, this is a belete mushroom. Nearly, well, all of the beletes are mycorrhizal. Here again, we've got another Amanita. Again, this is a mycorrhizal connection. We've got, this is the coral fungus, and this is again another ectomycorrhizal. And these are, these are there connecting up the trees. Now, 15% of the photosynthetic product from these trees is going to these fungus. Now that's a lot of energy for someone to give away. I mean, if we have to give away 15% of our energy, we need something good in return. Well, the fungus produces and provides 85% of that tree's nitrogen intake. So that's, that's, that's bonkers. That's if we were to say that these, these things disappeared, 85% of, of that of nitrogen but that's the nutrients that is feeding that tree would be gone. Um, the, the wood wide web, as we see it, like I said, it's gonna contain both arbuscular and ecto. And these connections um, are essentially lines of communication, which can go from trees of the same species to trees of you know, different species, and the arbuscular collecting all different herbaceous, you know, kind of woody shrubs, ground cover, climbers all together into the huge, huge network. So there was a kind of a, a theory within forestry or within kind of the, the, the ecology of woodlands that was always thinking that there was competition. That plants are on a race to sort of outcompete each other, and that woodlands and diverse woodlands are just different stages of this kind of battle of nature. Um, I'm going to talk quite a lot now about a lady called Suzanne Simard. Um, Suzanne Simard did a lot of the pioneering research in mycorrhizal fungi, um, and she was a forester from Canada. And um, she set up a series of experiments that that ended up showing us that it was cooperation. And she had to deal with a lot, a lot of, a lot of stick from a lot of people to finally get, you know, to allow it to be accepted. So I'm gonna talk through again, this process of what's happening, what's happening here in the tree. So we've got the, the leaves are creating sugars through photosynthesis. The sugar is traveling down the tree as sap, to the roots. The mycorrhizal connection allows this, this carbon product to move through, through the filaments of the hyphae, through pores in the cells, some of it being consumed by the fungus and some to neighbor, while some of it coming out as carbon. 
Now, you imagine this cooperation. Not only is the co cooperation between trees, cooperation is, is the fungus in the tree and the whole system. The fungus, it's in its best interest to keep this beautiful, healthy, diverse system alive. It wants as many connections to get all of the different nutrients it, it, it needs, essentially for its chemistry experiments under the woodland floor. So these connections between trees allow for exchange of resources, like we've spoken to and have spoken of, and for signaling molecules to be sent. So these molecules are essentially maybe distress signals. This is if the plant is under attack, if it is going through a drought, if there is a stress. Um, these signals allow, allow for neighbours to increase protective enzyme, um, and enzymes. So this was found in this paper, paper birch Douglas fir experiment. Um, this is the very famous um, first experiment of Suzanne Simard. And essentially what she did was with lots and lots of different test plots, she bagged up and sealed birch and Douglas fir. And they were all, they were control plots. And I, I, I'm gonna wrap this up in a kind of a nutshell. I also know that time is ticking. Um, and what she was doing is putting some trees under shade and some trees in the light, but under a bag, everything was bagged. Now, these trees uh, went from being connected in the same pot to being separated. And what she was doing is she was injecting these bags with, with a, a carbon isotope, a radioactive carbon isotope. This then, she then tested a tree that had not, that was in the same pot of a different species and found that this carbon had traveled underground to this neighboring plant. And this was the first sort of step in saying into, you know, different species can transfer this information to each other. These, the end of this project, she realized that during, during the summer, Birch sent more carbon to Douglas fir because the Douglas fir was shaded out by the birch leaves. However, during the autumn and winter, when the birch had lost its leaves and but the Douglas fir was still growing, it was sending more carbon to the birch. They were helping each other out. They were helping each other out. And this was the first real concrete evidence of like, holy moly, something's going on there. Um, those experiments kind of varied. There was a whole heap of forest, forest experiments in mycorrhizal. And um, I do encourage people that are interested to go check them out. I will not do it justice. Um, she has a wonderful book, Finding the Mother Tree. Um, it's written in a really kind of digestible way um which goes through her story and also all of her experiments with some humor and you can listen to it it's quite nice if you don't mind you know strong accents um so this concept mother trees these connections with within the woods these connections within the, for the forest there are mother trees this is what she was finding so sometimes called hub trees but these trees can recognize when it's a different species that they're connected to, when it's the same species, and they can, they can even recognize when it's their own kin. So they know there is genetic information. They are able to say, that is a daughter. That is, that is something that has come off of me. Now, although I said there was no competition as such, there is some sort of favorability. Um, the mother will always look after her own kin. And it seemed that when there were distress signals, mother trees would send resource to their own kin in larger amounts and first. Um, there was also research that proved that these mother trees, these veteran trees, if they were dying, would essentially download a first aid kit to their, to their offspring, which meant that they would, it, it's immunity responses. These dying mothers are downloading medical history as such, um, which 
which was shown to increase immunity in the future. And this would have been a, a kind of a whole heap of, of how to deal with this, how to deal with this genetic information. And it was a, it's, a, it's a download of how to deal with diseases. What you see on the left here is a map that was produced by Suzanne, um, which is showing the, the, the hubs and the networks. So the little yellow are the tiniest um, offspring under their parents. And from the paler to the darker, you see going in size. And these are the connections. Um, I think it just kind of sort of cements the fact that these veteran trees are so important and having them in the system as knowledge and genetic stores are vital for the health of the forest. Supporting these fungi. So I mentioned before about not tilling, so not coming through the soil. So if, if, you know, if you're in a garden and you're doing vegetable growing, kind of no dig practices, um, they are gonna, they're going to support those beneficial relationships. Reducing tillage, there's less tillage and disturbance in forests, however, um, but big machinery trampling through, compacting, um, that will cause it. Um, Mycorrhizal fungi need, they need aeration, they need oxygen to be able to survive in there, they need that water infiltration. Using cover crops, so if we are stripping a field of all plant life, spraying it all off and then waiting some time before planting something else and there is nothing to be formed with there are no relationships so those mycorrhizal will die or they will sit dormant and then it takes a lot longer to reproduce those those connections once something else is planted increasing that organic matter so we spoke again you know the soil food web that oxygenation we want we want things to go in we want to feed them we know that mycorrhizal are also saprotrophic um, it's been shown that woody debris, if you're planting trees, heavy, heavy wood chip mulch. Um, these species are, are taking it in and they're taking some of the nutrients and they are allowing that to also go back up into the host, but also using that to encourage other fungal um, allies to arrive. Avoiding fungicides, I think would be pretty obvious. Um, Actually, also a lot of herbicides and pesticides have really damaging um, effects on mycorrhizal connection. Um, that also goes with fertilizer, actually, because having too much, too many phosphates inhibit the growth too. It's, it's known that if you put something that it, with too, too many phosphates down, that it can kill off mycorrhizal. You can use inoculant products. So they, this is disputed and people say, oh, they don't work or root grow is naft but the truth is you need a inoculant that has a lot of species so you can buy root grow that is specific to roses you can buy you know you buy your specific root grow the same as if you're going to scatter this with trees you want to have as many species in there i would recommend um chaos fungorum which do a really beautiful edible mycorrhizal mix and if you're lucky you get some beautiful beliefs popping up uh, around your newly planted trees less cutting the protection of veteran trees so those mother mother trees the hubs i'm not saying we need to stop cutting down that's you know we need to stop cutting down certain forests and we need to stop cutting down in certain parts of the world but timber production is important and there, but there is no reason why timber production could not be sustainable and reaping huge benefits for the biodiversity you know the, the whole the whole system and increasing biodiversity value system-wide and plant a diverse range of species so like these these alchemists i keep calling them alchemists these they're pulling in from everywhere these complex relationships they're taking a bit from here a bit from there pushing to there there's knowledge from here having a diverse range of species is gonna like we go back to that quote the more nodes in the system the more resilient it is and for these fungi in particular, they want to have that diverse toolkit around them. Right, that was the end of the mycorrhizal section. Um, built myself buzzing a bit. Um, and I hope that we got that across. I really hope we got that across. I really encourage people to go and read Suzanne's book. 
and to look into this uh, for yourselves. So we're now on the final stretch. Roles within the changing world. Can fungi save the planet? <laughs> I, I believe they can. Um, there are incredible people out there, incredible mycologists doing incredible things everywhere. Um, this term micro restoration, I think is beautiful. This idea that we can restore things and we can, we can use fungi to save the planet. Now I'm going to chuck a, a bunch of words and put micro at the front of them now and uh, explain what they are. Microremediation. So as you may think, this is remediation. This is fungus sorting things out. So this is the use of fungi to um, degrade or remove toxins from the environment. Biological, chemical, industrial, these can be this is dealing with the waste products from a bunch of industries. This is water cleaning. This could be sorting out grain water. This could be sorting out rivers. This could be sorting out excess phosphates. They can deal with heavy metals. Um, they've been known, fungi have been known to metabolize um, neurotoxins. So war, war and you know warfare, chemical warfare. And they're able to take those products that linger in systems and actually turn them into safe compounds to store them. Um, they've also been known to grow in radioactive or toxic sites. So what these, what these fungi are doing, and, and most fungal species, especially saprotrophs, have an ability to remove toxins and they're changing them in certain ways, right? What that fungus is doing is they're taking it and then they're pushing and they're storing some in a fruiting body and they're putting some into the ground, but like I said, they are changing the chemical compounds. Um, this is the, the, the biogeochemical cycle, um, which is essentially working with elements and moving elements around. Water cleaning, uh, I also kind of want to push everyone to, to look into reed bed systems as well. Um, phyto remediation, so using plants to do the same thing. There's amazing solutions for dealing with our sewage that comes from using plants, um, which is fascinating. And also the microfiltration. So this should maybe have its own slide. Um, it is technically a separate idea. However, microfiltration is the net that is formed by the fungus. And this is catching things. So this can be a physical filtration. So this can be an actual sediment buildup that happens because of a myce mycelial growth. But also this is this is microfiltration within microremediation, where you've got a net that is catching certain chemicals and treating them on its way through. It's holding them there and it's securing them. Right. So I'm going to show you. This is um, from Paul Stamets. Now, I'll talk a little bit about Paul Stamets in a, in a little while when I talk about books and going onwards. But um, this was an experiment that he took part in, which was dealing with petroleum soaked soil. So the soil had one to two percent um, petroleum content, which was 10,000 parts per million. Now, this is seriously. Um, soiled soil <laughs> and what they were doing is they were trying to test different ways to try and deal with the petroleum now on he, he paul stamets inoculated his pile with oyster mushroom spawn now what you can see here is the oyster mushrooms actually fruiting from that pile so when this was happening none of the other test piles nothing was happening I mean, the content was just the same and this clearly is already this is already working the oyster mushrooms have managed to grow they've managed to grow in that soil substrate that means they are digesting it somehow and now they are fruiting within 16 weeks they reduced it to less than 200 parts per million and plants started to colonize this mound um this is just proof that fungi can break down these awful compounds that we pump out and spill around in the world. Um, again, Paul Stamets 
in his he's got a few books um and i'll talk about i'll talk about them in a sec but you can find lots of things with his experience of micro remediation and you can find lots of things online micro fabrication <laughs> i told you there was going to be lots of micro words um this is biofabrication this is creating materials out of organic things um in this case we're creating materials out of fungi this is being used in construction this is to being used for packaging furniture textiles artificial meat you know replacements for meat um and essentially what's happening and typical nearly in all of these cases is that the mycelium is grown on a substrate just like i showed you and if you think back to the the image of the straw being colonized by those mushrooms that mycelial block, that mycelia is, is grown in a mold. It's then taken as a living organism. It sounds a bit gruesome, but normally heated or it's, it's frozen and then heated. You know, they go through various different processes that allow for the mushroom to stop growing and for it to solidify. So say you were growing on wood pellets, you're growing something on wood pellets, well, it's sawdust essentially, compacted wood pellets. You grow a substance through it that binds it all together and then you dry that out you've got a piece of plyboard that's been reinforced with another with another material now there is a whole world of this and i i was a little bit lazy getting you the images because um ecovative um which are one of the leading kind of manufacturers of this sort of stuff they had lots of pretty pictures on their main page so everything you see over here is from them um but you can see we've got mushroom packaging um they can create foams and fabrics they've got their, their meat-free bacon they've got here their air mycelium which is it's a, this is like a leather it's like a plastic it's flexible it's malleable they've got their micro composite um which is used in that packaging it why we're still needing to use plastic packaging products i do not know i do not know over here on the right you see some mycelial blocks that are being used in, in buildings this whole structure has been built out of mycelium. So again, that same process that would have been colonized and then has been treated and then it is they're going through strength tests. And um, yeah, let's watch the space because in some time um, we might be making houses out of mycelium. Medicine. So again, this is another topic that could have had its own had its own uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to kind of really briefly run through some of the benefits and you know talk around the medicinal value of mushrooms. I think we know you know penicillin completely revolutionised the way that modern medicine was able to function and you know arguably saved our country in a very tight spot. Um, and that came from a mould. Um, Mushroom medicine has been around for thousands and thousands of years, and especially in the East, is being used as a traditional practice for a very, very long time. Um, I've put a list here together of the, the sort of different benefits that comes from medicinal mushrooms. Um, it could have gone on, and it's probably too brief, but essentially you've got that immune support they're full of antioxidants, uh, support healthy inflammation responses, um, balancing blood sugar. They can support brain health and cognition. They can support the nervous system. They can increase energy and stamina. Um, there is a whole list that go on much more complex and go in depth. And you will find lots of information about the different compounds that these mushrooms produce and what they can do for us. I am going to give us a brief overview of six um six mushrooms that are, are you know not the top most medicinal mushrooms but some of the most common and well well kind of yeah uh, widely used so up here we've got a beautiful lion's mane which is a tooth fungus um lion's mane is being used uh to support healthy brain function it's being thought to help um with memory and 
uh, regenesis. It's, it's thought that it may support regenesis, so the actual regeneration of neural networks and neural pathways in the brain. This is being used a lot and um, it's supposedly very good for people suffering with dementia and um, Alzheimer's. We've got the reishi. So the reishi was known as the immortality mushroom. This is one of the oldest used mushrooms throughout China. It's known to support the immune system. Um, it's said to give people restful sleep and a calm mind, um, reduce stress and restlessness, and has links to supporting lung and respiratory health. Um, also chuck in there, um, support blood sugar levels. So it's doing quite a lot of things. Um, just uh, yeah, from, from drinking that over a regular period of time. We've got shiitake, which some of you may know is a very tasty mushroom that you get in a pad thai when you go to the Thai place. Um, shiitake has been cultivated on logs. It's probably one of the oldest agricultural methods that we, we know of. Um, and it's supporting immunity and liver health. Um, it also supports the cardiovascular system and contains a hell of a lot of B vitamins. Turkey tail, we've got here. Now, the turkey tail boosts the immune system um, and it has a whole range of benefits that I cannot read to you because it list is humongous. But one of the most notable is that it is thought that it relieves certain symptoms of chemotherapy and it's been used within uh, and in addition to cancer treatments. And there are really, really positive um, results coming from that. We've got oyster mushrooms. Um, these are some that I was growing when I was living in India. Um, they're low calories, maybe not a medicinal benefit, but good to know if you're on a diet. <laughs> low in fat, high in protein, and they contain a range of vitamins and minerals, including niacin, vitamin B12, and a whole heap of antioxidants. Um, they support heart health and metabolic health. And one of my favorite things about oyster mushrooms is that they have the ability to store vitamin D from the sun. So you can put these guys outside and let them sunbathe and they do the same thing that we do in our skins. They have enzymes that, that create vitamin D from the sunlight and they store it. You can dehydrate them and you can literally have a vitamin D supplement. And we've got that ant zombie mushroom again, the cordyceps. Um, a lot of people think the last thing that they want to do with that, knowing what it's done is to eat that. Well, actually they go for a lot of money. They're a very expensive um, delicacy. Uh, these are known to improve lung capacity and increase energy. Um, they're, they're known as something that's they're dealing with stamina. It's, it's used as a, like a, a support if you're doing, you know, exerted uh, physical exercise. Um, when I was in India, actually, so in Nepal, I can't remember the name that they call, but they, they have a cordyceps that, again, is kind of seen like an immortality um, supplement. And people pay thousands and thousands of, of rupees to, to get just a couple of these. And men go off into the jungles in Nepal and around Sikkim and northeast India. And they go out and they collect them from the branches of trees growing out of caterpillars and they take them. And I remember I got gifted some um, by a friend that came in a little box and still had the caterpillars attached. And I was meant to just eat them. And I must say, I ate a few of them, felt a little bit strange. Um, and unfortunately, the rest in the box went mouldy, which I could never tell the guy because I felt so bad because it was such a precious thing that he gifted me. Now it's out you guys know. So I appreciate that was a real quick whistle stop around those, but it gives you a bit of an insight into um, the medicinal mushroom world. Things to consider, obviously consult with your doctor. I am not a doctor. Um, taking your health into your own hands is great, but making sure that it's compatible with other medication or other, you know, um, ailments you might have is, is important. I want to make you aware there is a mushroom mycelium debate going on. Um, this is that some people that are producing these supplements are using mushrooms, using fruit and bodies and powdering, powdering, and some are using the mycelium. Now, the truth is what it seems from the research is that both have benefits. Mycelium 
has a whole range of compounds and the mushroom has a whole range of different compounds. Now, if, you, if you're interested in taking mushroom supplements, you probably will come across that at some point. Do your research and get into the beta glucans protein mycelium mushroom debate because it's um, rather tedious, but um, interesting. Um, you want to know where the product is sourced from. Uh, you know, you don't really want to be buying reishi from China when you know that it's from a really not so super great place. Um, just check into that, look how it's being produced and make sure that it's all wholesome and um, make sure the product is trusted. It's very easy to powder some things up and sell it to someone. And with this being kind of a new emerging um, kind of industry, the kind of the, the guidelines or the, you know, the vetting of these products isn't really there yet. Okay. So what would a mushroom talk be without the mention of psilocybin? Um, it's probably one of the one of the things that I get asked the most. I say, oh, I'm really doing this, I'm growing mushrooms, I'm doing this, and people go, well, magic mushrooms. I'm going, no, not magic mushrooms. Um, however, I would like to inform you about magic mushrooms. Um, Again, just a disclaimer, this is, I, I am not encouraging anyone to take any hallucinogenics or look into this for, for yourselves. This is an illegal substance. This is an illegal substance. It is a naturally produced illegal substance, but it is an illegal substance. And the Wildlife Trust definitely, definitely do not recommend any going anywhere near this. Um, so <laughs> there are currently therapeutic trials going on and there's research happening in major universities and medical universities all over the world which is testing psilocybin which is the psychoactive compound within the, the magic mushrooms um, as a as an approach for, for kind of dealing with mental health challenges it's either using natural compounds or it's synthesized versions of psilocybin and alongside um, kind of psychological support people are put through therapy sessions. Um, you can see someone down here that is in said therapy session and there are plenty of studies. Um, you can find a lot on the John Hopkins web page um, that kind of go into the details of this. Psilocybin has been a part of human society for a very long time. Um, I think that hiding away from that why well, it's it's there we can see it we know that many cultures take hallucinogens and have that as part of a maybe a spiritual religious practice there is stone age art Not that contain, containing idols um of various kind of psilocybin mushrooms um i would not encourage anyone to go out and try and do this yourself and Personally, uh, the research still isn't there and the, the jury's still out on whether or not this is beneficial. Um, and there are real risks associated with this, especially if it's not in a safe environment. Um, sadly, I think the truth is, is that we may have come to a lot of these kind of conclusions and research um, in the 60s, this sort of research started um, within psychedelics and medicine. Um, but it was curbed and I'm sure that many of you know the story of naughty professors um, at Harvard and their research getting stopped which essentially ended up with things being made illicit substances across the world. Um, yeah that's that's pretty much it about psilocybin. It's, an, it's a very interesting compound. Psychoactives within fungi are not so rare and you can find psychoactives throughout the whole kind of plant and fungi kingdom. Um, what their purpose is, no one's completely sure. The theories around psilocybin and mushrooms is kind of a deterrent. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of theories that say that it was put there to guide people as a medicine. The scientific research around that is sticking purely to depression and mental health benefits and not dealing with kind of origin of species or 
evolutionary theories. Um, there is an interesting theory of evolution that's, that's called the stone ape hypothesis. Um, essentially, there are a bunch of people that believe that we have evolved by eating magic mushrooms. So there would have been a time where we were walking across the savannah as primate uh, versions of ourselves. And what we would have been doing um, is kind of browsing, foraging as we go. And it is said that across the savannah, there would have been dung and at the dung, there would have been psilocybe cubensis growing. And these, these primates would have taken them and ate them and gone on these experiences that led them to have increased kind of leadership, their cognitive abilities expanded. And, and it's what people have hypothesized, have hypothesized kind of allowed that jump um, from letting us imagine. It evolved us to the point where we could create society as we know it. So on that note, leaving you wondering about the, the kind of creation of, of humans, um, that is the end. I um, unfortunately have a had a technical hitch with resources. So I, I'll give a brief shout out to some books um, that I should probably, wait, if I do this. Uh, uh, uh. I'm trying to unblur my background. I'm not sure if you can see me because I can't see me. Not sure if that's, there we go. Right, so I'm gonna talk through a couple of books. Um, yeah, we had a technical hitch. I did have a resource sheet that I wanted to share with you, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna point you in the direction of amazing books and we'll have to leave it there. Um, Paul Stamets, I mentioned, this is his Mycelium Running book, which is a um, how mushrooms can help save the world. This contains a lot of the information that I was talking about and is a really wonderful intro um, into the world of microremediation, growing mushrooms, and all of that kind of micro restoration. Now, if you are interested in mycorrhizal fungi, um, that's as a grower, that's as a forester, um, this is sort of an essential book for you. So this is Teeming with Fungi, The Organic Grower's Guide to Mycorrhizal, which is by Jeff Lowenfels. Now, this comes in a set. Um, you can buy this, there's three. There's Teeming with Microbes, which is a guide to the soil food web. And there is Teeming with Nutrients. Now, these are written as kind of, they're very, very comprehensive in simple layman terms. So they are digestible, you can pick out snippets, but this is probably the most comprehensive, concise book on mycorrhizal that I found that just talks about the science, talks about the structure and is beautiful with beautiful images and very informative. Now, another one of my favorite books is Earth Repair. So for those of you that are interested in how to save soils and um, healing toxic and damaged landscapes, um, this is by Leela Darwish. Um, and it's a wonderful book, Earth Repair. And there's a lot about microremediation, a lot about sorting out oil spills and toxic ground and giving solutions. Now, there's a book that I've only got on the PDF, so I can't hold it up. But if any of you are really, really wanting to deep dive into mycology, I would recommend Radical Mycology by Peter McCoy. Um, it's a treatise of working with fungi. And it is probably the most comprehensive scientific manual that talks around fungus. Um, and also a couple to mention if you're interested in growing is that there are kind of many guides from Paul Stamets and he's got a famous growing medicinal and gourmet mushrooms, which is a beautiful book. The last one that I'm going to talk about, um, or maybe second to last, penultimate, is the Roger Phillips Mushroom Guide. So Roger Phillips, unfortunately, has passed away now, but this is probably, this is the go-to mushroom guide for most mycologists, kind of amateur mycologists, people out in the field. Um, it's a beautiful photo ID guide. This is quite an odd copy. You can get them all around. You might find them in charity shops. He also does really 
other really great kind of um, ID guides and companion volumes for ferns and mosses and wild food. It's a beautiful book and very, very informative. I suppose just a couple. Um, we've got the River Cottage Handbook on mushrooms. So if you would like an ID guide that also has a bunch of beautiful recipes on how to cook up um, all of these mushrooms that you're finding, and if you're a fan of, of uh, Hugh Fernley Witterstall, then um, there is the River Cottage Guide to Mushrooms. Um, I must say, I'm quite particular about the way I, I um, like mushrooms cooked, and so I haven't tried too many. I've tried some, very tasty, as you can imagine. Um, and the last one, if you're looking for a general foraging guide and you want to combine your kind of fungi enthusiasm with other plants, I would recommend this pocket-sized Wild Food UK foraging book. Um, it's got basically all you need to know about the common mushrooms that you're going to find alongside beautiful plants that you can find on your hedgerows. Um, there's plenty of resource out there um, and on YouTube you can search and you can search around. I would really encourage anyone, um, maybe the bookseller wouldn't like this, but I would encourage anyone before you, if you're looking for online books or digital copies, type in a name of said book and just type in PDF. I've got a whole heap of these mushroom guides and mushroom um, textbooks by just searching for mycelium running PDF and you'll be able to find that within a couple of clicks and download it for yourself without paying lots of money. But um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much um, for listening to me, Waffle On, for what's been a very long 